<laughs> In this video, I would like to look at the Gospel of John and primarily look at chapter 1. When we look at the book of John and we think of authorship, some want to assign it to John the Presbyter, but I personally would understand John the Apostle to be the author of this wonderful, wonderful gospel. It differs from the synoptic gospels in that John will develop seven signs in the first 12 chapters that show that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is the Christ. And then there will be, uh, beginning in 13, through chapter 17, actually through 16, we have the upper room discourse where Christ will be teaching the disciples, getting them ready for his uh, death and resurrection. This is followed then uh, and by his high priestly prayer in chapter 17. And then in 18, 19, and 20, we have his trials and his crucifixion, leading then to the resurrection in chapter 20. And the key to understanding the book of John are the signs that John is setting forth. He gives the purpose of the book himself in John chapter 20, verses, 20, verses 30 to 31. It says, truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, leave, by believing you might have life in his name. So the heart of John's purpose is to show that Jesus is the Son of God that he is divine, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's the main, can I say, purpose uh, or theme of John's gospel. Then, as we look at author, date, theme, uh, historical background, we're probably thinking of maybe around 90, 85, or 90 AD, the book of John uh, would have been written. The Gospel of John. And again, he is showing forth very tangibly the humanness of Jesus and yet his full divinity. And he wants to drive that home with sign and then discourse. And as you look at the Gospel of John, it'll go sign, discourse, sign, discourse. That'll be the way it is developed. For example, in the first uh, chapter, we see the great prologue in 1, 1 to 18. This is followed then by Jesus beginning to call disciples to follow him in chapter 1. Then we begin the signs. We have the sign of changing water to wine, which is a sign of creation. This is followed then by the discourse on Jesus as the divine creator in spiritual new birth in Nicodemus in chapter uh, three, and the woman at the well by giving her water whereby she will never ever thirst again. So the creator who is able to change uh, water into wine is able to give eternal water to the woman at the well. We then have the second sign which is Jesus healing a nobleman's son at a distance and pronouncing his healing, which shows again his divinity, that he's able to do that uh, and know that it happened even at a distance. He speaks the word and it's done. Furthermore, we have the third sign in Christ healing the paralytic man. Uh, and we see that in chapter five, where Jesus heals a man, and then he gives his discourse. And his discourse talks about his authority. 
how that he is equal with God in power. And we see his authority witnessed by John the Baptist, by a number of witnesses, by his works, by the Father, and by scripture itself in chapter five. This is then followed by the next two signs in chapter six, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And this is followed then by Jesus walking on the water. And so we see again his power to feed 5,000 plus <laughs> with uh, very little to do it with, uh, a few loaves and some fish, he's able to accomplish that. And then he walks on water, showing that he is God in the second person of the Trinity. This is followed then by a discourse on manna come down from heaven in chapter 6. So after feeding the 5,000, John then has a discourse on manna and how Christ will feed with eternal food. And he is the expected one. The rabbis said when Messiah would come, he would bring back the manna. And that's what we have here in chapter 6. As we move into 7, and on into eight, we have Jesus claiming to be the light of the world. And that's the discourse. This is followed then by healing a blind man, the next sign to prove and demonstrate that he is the light of the world. And again, uh, the religious leaders kick the blind man out of the synagogue because he is pointing to Christ as the one who healed him, and he must be, uh, you know, God or the Messiah, and they uh, excommunicate him, and then we have the wonderful parable of the Good Shepherd, or the wonderful, can I say, teaching on how Christ, I should say, is the Good Shepherd, an exposition, really, of Psalm 23. This is followed, then, by the Lord claiming to Martha uh, to be the resurrection and the life. And following that, we have the climactic sign of raising Lazarus, showing that he is indeed the resurrection and the life. And so these signs make up the theme of the first 12 chapters of John, beginning in chapter 1 and going to the end of chapter 12, followed by discourse. Again, sign discourse. Uh, changing water to wine, discourse on Jesus can give new birth, and he gives eternal water. Healing the nobleman's son at a distance, followed by uh, healing the man at the pool, the third sign, and then his authority is set forth. And then the fourth sign, would be the manna, but we have two other things, feeding the 5,000, walking on water. We have the fourth and fifth sign, followed then by the great discourse of manna from heaven. And then Jesus is the light of the world, the sixth sign, healing the blind man uh, in chapter 9, followed then after uh, the discourse on the Good Shepherd, the wonderful, wonderful uh, statement that he is the resurrection and the dead, and shows that after that discourse by raising Lazarus. So sign, discourse, sign, discourse, sign, discourse, seven signs. Seven is a number of perfection, making up, can I say, uh, the Gospel of John in these chapters, one to twelve. Then we have the Great Upper Room Discourse, which is a wonderful uh, section. I have worked through this, looking at every word grammatically in Greek, and uh, it's a wonderful discourse where Jesus prepares his disciples for his crucifixion. And it's wonderful to know how that he becomes a servant to them by washing feet. He claims uh, in chapter 14, to be the way, the truth, and the life. Beautifully develops that in chapter uh, 14, I should say. In 15, 
He sets forth how believers are to relate to one another. In 16, further work of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, four paraclete passages make up this upper room discourse. The pouring out of the Spirit and what he would do. This is then followed by the crucifixion of our Lord, uh, the trial and crucifixion in 18 and 19, followed by the resurrection in 20. And the resurrection in 20 is a beautiful chapter. I've enjoyed preaching on that chapter for many years, how that everything becomes more physical. They look into the tomb, uh, but don't go in. And then Peter goes in and uh, sees the empty tomb with the grave clothes folded. And then Jesus appears to Mary and she's clinging to him, showing the physicality of it all. And then Jesus appears to the 12 in the upper room, showing them his hands and feet. And Thomas is not there, but a week later he appears saying, Thomas, look at my nail prints in my hands and my feet and be no more disbelieving, but believing. And that's got to be the climax of the Gospel of John, pointing to the physicality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 21, Jesus appears to his disciples for a fish breakfast, and he continu continues to ask Peter, if you love me, Peter, feed my sheep. And over and over again, there is that exhortation of feeding sheep. And that is something that we, uh, as ministers, are to do. We are to feed God's sheep. And may we uh, take uh, heed to what the Lord is saying there. So with this introduction, uh, I want to begin chapter 1, in which in chapter 1, we see the great prologue in 1, 1 to 14. And in this section, we see how the word which is Christ, is eternal, was always with the Father from all eternity, face to face, and how then all things were made by the Word, by Christ, and that by coming to him, uh, he shines in the darkness, and he gives life, and the darkness could not mug that light. The resurrection continues to make it valid, and as we move on, Jesus Christ then is coming and those who are willing to accept him and believe in him have eternal life. Not by, not by being born uh, a certain way, but through his uh, sacrifice, one is able to enter into eternal life. This is culminated then in how the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us followed then by how Jesus begins to call uh, his disciples one by one to follow him, John's witness to Christ, and then how Andrew and Peter begin to follow Jesus. I would like to just conclude by reading the uh, first part, the prologue of John, John 1.1 to uh, verse 14, and then stop and then continue doing this in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was face to face with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning face to face with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not, could not only comprehend it, but could not take it down. There was a man sent from God who, whose name was John. The man came for a witness, to bear witness concerning the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the genuine light, which gives light to every man who comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world knew him not. He came into his own but his own received him not. But the good news, as many as received him, to them he gave power or the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, 
nor out of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and literally dwelt among us, pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness, we all have received and grace in the place of grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten son who was in the, bo who was in the bosom of the father, he has declared him or he has literally exegeted him. This by way of concluding remark, this great prologue shows the eternality of Jesus, that he was always face to face with the Father, and that he was fully God. It shows that he's the agent of creation, everything was made through him, and that he is the source of life, and that the darkness could not defeat Christ. It can, he continues to, to shine because he's conquered death. There was a man in this section we're told, and that was John the Baptist. He came to bear witness concerning the light. He was not the light though, John wants us to know, but he was only to bear witness to the light. And the light that he was bearing witness to was Christ, who is that true light, which gives light to everyone by his coming into the world. So everyone has a chance to see where the truth is. He was in the world though, and the world came to be through him, but the world refused to know him. And even though he came into his own, his own things, his very own did not receive him. There's a play on the Greek. He came unto his idia, his own things, but his idioi did not receive him. That is his own uh, kinsman at that time. But as many as received him, he gave to them the right to become the sons of God. What a beautiful thought. And this, we become children of God, not by being born in a certain bloodline, not by the will of the flesh, by human effort, or the will of a man like in human birth to have a child, but it's a divine birth. It's from God. And that will be commented on later in the Gospel of John. And the word then became flesh. Uh, he was eternal, but he became human and without sin, pitched his tent among us. He escaped sin. He tabernacled among us. And we gazed upon his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When you look upon Christ, you're seeing God. In, in Psalm 117, God is full of grace and truth. And so Jesus is the, can I say, the embodiment of that in the flesh. And John says, <coughs> uh, the Gospel of John says that John bore witness and cried out, this is the one of whom uh, I said would come after me, but he really was before me, showing the eternality of Jesus and of his fullness, we all have received grace in the place of grace, grace multiplied. And the law, though, was not eternal, uh, as sometimes uh, it was thought in rabbinic sources, the law was always with God and he looked into it to see how to create. But the one that was eternal, the law was not, it came through Moses, the one that was eternal was Jesus, who is full of grace and truth. And so no one has ever seen God at any time, but the only begotten son, who is God himself, uh, the only begotten God in the flesh is the one who is now in the bosom of the Father, having ascended, who is at the right hand of God. He has literally exegeted him or declared him. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, we're told in John chapter 14. So this is the introduction to the great book of John. And what I'd like to do is read through the chapter and just give a brief summary of them. I might just say one more thing. 
the Lagos teaching goes back to the Mimra, which is the Aramaic word for word, and we find it in Jewish Targums. It reads, in the beginning God created and the word said. And so clearly John is coming from a Jewish background showing that Jesus is clearly divine, uh, coming from that <coughs> background. And so to me, this is a wonderful, wonderful text. And chapter one will finish it uh, in the next video that we do, where we'll see Jesus beginning to call disciples uh, to follow him.